The Holy Gospel according to Mark, chapter 6, verses 30 to 34, and 53 to 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gensaret, and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was and wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms. They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'd like to thank these two guys here, Pastor Greg and Pastor Ken, for giving me the privilege to share a message with you today. It's kind of an honor, and one way I wanted to celebrate my anniversary was to preach a sermon. So here I am. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. You would think after 50 years of doing this, that I would come out here completely calm and confident and just be at ease. I'm a little nervous because in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth and they didn't like him and they drove him out of town. Um, I don't have my track shoes on, but if you're going to try to get rid of me, I will run faster than you. So. <laughs> But I am very privileged to be here. Um, on May 1st, I mean May 25th, 1968, I was ordained a priest in the Roman Catholic Church for the Diocese of Green Bay. It was a pretty much, it was an exciting time, but also it was a heavy time because my dad had died three weeks before I was ordained. And then this past June 1st, 2018, for those who got good math skill, that's 50 years. <laughs> um, I was publicly recognized at the Lutheran Church, North Carolina Synod for 50 years of ministry. I'm grateful for all those years of ministry. But I'd like to just share with you some reflections on what ministry has meant to me in the last 50 years. I'd like to read just a little meditation from a book called Seasons of a Lifetime by Gerhard Frost. He writes a beautiful meditation on anniversaries. Anniversaries are thinking places, thanking places, and where one may reflect and reveal, recollect and renew, taste and savor, all that's been, the better to receive all that is to be. 
Anniversaries are breathing spaces, healing places, where one may pause and set one's burdens down, not to abandon, but to grasp it once again with greater courage and resolve. Anniversaries are milestones where one may be repossessed by the goodness of God. During the last several weeks, I have found myself doing a lot of remembering of all the pastoral situations that I've experienced in those 50 years. Some are, were traumatic, but as I reflected on those different memories, as they, some of them just suddenly came to mind that I hadn't thought about for years. But I noticed there was a theme kind of running through my memories. And that was, the theme was kind of that the most vivid memories that I was remembering were memories of being with people who were suffering. Maybe it's suffering from grief or suddenly announcement of a severe illness. But those are the kind of things that I believe shape much of my ministry, of being with people when they're going through trauma. Because I think so many times when people are confronted with trauma and difficulty and suffering and pain, sometimes they raise the question, why? In my 50 years of ministry, I've never been able to answer the question, why? But I think the real faith question that unfolds when we're going through difficulties in life is not the question why. I think the question is how. How am I going to get through this trauma? How am I going to get through chemotherapy? How am I going to get through the death of my spouse? How am I going to get through when my son or daughter is addicted? Why those things happen, I don't know. But I definitely believe very deeply that God does not send that into people's lives. It happens in life. And we have to ask ourselves, what enables me to have the strength and how do I get through this trauma? Part of my ministry has always been trying to reassure people that when they're in that trauma, God is with them, and God is suffering with you. That's what Psalm 23 is all about. When you're going through the valley of darkness, I will be there. I'd like to share just two experiences that I've had going back in the years. And one experience has my hair has turned gray, um, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, I share two experiences of being with people in pain. I could share other experiences that were, some of them were very funny. At a wedding where the bride passed out twice. But, so, but, um, the first experience was I was still, I was a priest in um, St. Matthew Church in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I get a phone call and this daughter calls me and says, Father Mike, could you come over? I think my father is dying. Why she called me and not 911, I don't know. But I went over there. I walked into the house and there in the living room floor is her father. And he's chanting some mantra. I had no idea what language it was. I had no idea what... The translation would have been in English. So then I said to him, do you want to get help? He says, no, I'm more comfortable on the floor. So I went down on the floor with him. Sat with him or knelt there and shared some prayer with him. But all through my prayer, he's chanting. And then I had to get back to the rectory because I had another commitment. I told the daughter, I says, if there's any changes, call me. Well, Another half hour, 45 minutes, she calls and says, I think my father has died. So 
I go over there again. And as a minister, you often share prayers with the family when a loved one has died. And then I asked the daughter, what was your father chanting? And what language was it? She says, Polish. I said, well, what, how would you translate that into English? And she said, this is a phrase that was very powerful at that time. She says, in English it means, Jesus, come to me. So what that man was chanting, Jesus, come to me. Jesus, come to me. Jesus, come to me. That was really moving and really touched my faith life. That here was this a big guy lying on the floor chanting in his native language was Polish. And he's saying, Jesus, come to me. Another experience that I had was this one couple I knew quite, quite well. This also happened back in the Green Bay Diocese, Mike and Pat Valentine. They had two children, and then she got pregnant again. And her time for delivery came up, and she says, would you come up when, the, when it's time for the baby to be born? So I, I went up there, but when I got to the room, I found out that something really difficult had occurred. The baby was full term, but the baby was born dead. Mike and Pat Valentine was a young couple filled with strong faith. His parents were there, who I knew also knew very well. And her parents were there. And I was there, so there was, I guess, what, seven of us. What do you say when you have a situation like that? But shortly after I was there, a nurse comes in holding the child. And each one of us took our turn to hold that child. Some of us prayed and some of us just held the child in silence. I will never forget the feeling of the depths of faith in that hospital room. In such a experience of trauma, here was families filled with faith. There was plenty of sadness and plenty of tears. But underlying those tears was a confidence that God was with them. Another theme that was running through my memories, I'm not going to share any bad memories. The memories I share have been sacred memories. To be with a man who's chanting, to be with a couple who's mourning the death of a child. That theme is, in all my preaching and efforts, I've always tried to somehow communicate to every congregation I serve the greatness of God. That God always relates to us in a spirit of abundance. Great is thy faithfulness. Your mercies are renewed morning after morning after morning. That God relates us with that abundance, the greatness of kindness, the greatness of goodness, of forgiveness, of mercy, also the greatness of gentleness. I'm going to focus on that theme, on gentleness, because I deeply believe it's a virtue that's not very present in human interactions in our society today. I'd like to just read a little quote from a, this isn't in print anymore, but I got the very first copy of, that they made and I got the last copy. This one happens to be on gentleness. This person writes, Much has been written in recent years about the progressive coarsening of Western culture, especially the United States. Rough handling of people, ideas, and affairs flourishes at all levels of social and political life. Radio talk shows, TV talk shows thrive on conflict and anger. 
Road wagers bedevil highways. Political leaders demean one another. Even church bodies are divided by hardness. The salve of restraint, thoughtful consideration, gentleness and outlook and action seem to be an increasingly endangered species of human interaction. In my very first church in 1968, someone gave me a plaque that said, and I have it on my wall, only the strong have the courage to be gentle. It does not take courage to be strong. It does not take courage to demean someone, either by our words or by our actions. And gentleness is, is not meekness. Gentleness is a spirit that we re God's greatness comes to us in his gentleness. The Bible is filled with several verses, several quotes from different books of the Bible that talks about God's gentleness. I'd like to share just a couple with you. And when I speak about gentleness, we're talking about God's greatness. What does that mean? God's gentleness is a gift that he's given us. And our responsibility is to share that gift. Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come to me, all you who are weary and overburdened, and I will give you rest. Shoulder my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. Can we live with such gentleness and openness to people that we can welcome people who are weary in our age, in our time? Come to me, all you who are weary with poverty. Come to me, all you who are weary and overburdened by intolerance. Come to me, all you who are weary because you're dealing with the disease. Can we reach out to people in such a fashion that we welcome people who are hurting because we are gentle of heart? In Ephesians, bear with one another charitably in complete selflessness, gentleness, and patience. Colossians, you are God's chosen race, his saints, he loves you. You should be clothed in sincere compassion, in kindness, Humility, gentleness, and patience. I could probably give a sermon on patience. Galatians 5.22 What the Spirit brings is very different. The Spirit brings love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. I'm going to encourage, I've shared some memories with you in the meaning of ministry, but I'm also going to give you some homework. Because one of the, my styles of been preaching is I always feel that a sermon should bring comfort. I also feel a sermon should give us challenge. And my challenge is that you always try to relate gently with other people in any human interaction. Because when we are given that gift of God's greatness of gentleness, powerful things begin to unfold. Is that we begin to experience a sense of peacefulness rather than, because when gentleness is lacking, there's an awful lot of rancor in all aspects of our society as well as in the world. But when we approach life with a a gentle manner, we begin to build connections and bridges to people who are different. When we are gentle, we, we re allow people to come, up, come to us in a spirit of hospitality, especially people who are hurting.
should be able to find within us, within this congregation, that when they're hurting or when they feel they're being abused because their ethnicity is a little bit different than whiteness, that's when we bring the bridges and span. I was going to refer to this reading, but it's not used at the 11:15 service. It was the second reading from Ephesians, where because of Christ, the hostility between Jew and Gentile went away, and they became one united body. I think when we live with that gentleness, we live with a spirit of strength, but also we live in that sense that when life unfolds, no matter what the situation might be, I bring a gentle heart to the conversation or to the situation. Then I think we begin to live in a world that is peaceful as God had planned. Amen.